Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Trinity this morning. This may be the third Sunday in a row of sunshine. Seems like it. Had all that rain now. Now we're going to head towards a drought. We don't have to watch it. But um, so we welcome Pastor Richard back again with us this week. Um, I guess I'd like to say too that a friend of Pastor Richard's is here, Kevin Sherman. They're sitting uh, with me and uh, an active member of Salem Reformed Church and visiting here to uh, support Richard this morning and be with us. Thank you, Kevin, for, for being here. Um, and then I would like to announce uh, that our council would invite you to remain after our church services next uh, Sunday, November the 3rd for a brief congregational update on our pastoral search progress and a couple options that we want to talk to you about on our uh, search process. Uh, you know, we, we, we'll try and keep it, we, we don't envision a long meeting, it's just a, a, an update, hope we keep it kind of brief. And I do want to say, I mean, you don't have to be a member to stay for that meeting because people who attend are the people we want to share this with and, and get feedback on. Um, as Thanksgiving approaches, please consider a donation of cash or canned goods to assist the Thermont Ministerium and the Food Bank in providing the staples for Thanksgiving feasts for those less fortunate in and around our community. Donations are being accepted November 8th through the 22nd. So you could bring your food donations here, or of course, if you want to make a, a cash or check donation, that would go to our treasurer Andy, and that would be written out to a Trinity UCC and put uh, the food bank in the memo on that. And uh, the, the, the food bank is, uh, you know, the, the, the need is increasing uh, gradually over time, the need increasing, so they're really, are trying to reach out to the churches for uh, more do donations, particularly this time of year. Um, I also want to, I haven't heard too many others have heard more of Sue Clayball. I mean, she's recuperating well. It's uh, uh, slow but steady, and she's walking much better than, uh, than a week or two ago. So um, that, that's encouraging. Uh, and my, and my last I talked to her a bit, she may be getting out of the nursing home early part of November, some first or, or the first 10 days somewhere in November. Uh, so that, that's all quite encouraging for Sue. Um, are there any other joys and concerns that people would like to share? All right then. Please join me in unison in the call to worship. Lord God, in this short time together, open our ears and our eyes to see your vision for this place and our part within it. Teach us, hear our prayers, and enable us for service wherever you might take us. To your praise and glory. Amen. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Yet we often have difficulty living in that new reality, clinging to the old ways that have passed. When we confess our sin, we make room for God's truth to dwell in us, clearing the path for a new way of life before God with the people of God. Let us confess our faults and our failings. Let us pray silently. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy and beloved God, though we wander from your path as though we don't have a care in the world, it is you who protects us and guides us back. When we would choose falsehood, 
tighten your belt of truth around us. When we get you corrupted by the world, cover us with your long sleeve shirt of righteousness that reminds us of your purity. When we would walk in the tall grass wearing sandals, cover our feet with boots, ready to take the gospel of peace even to the den of snakes. When thorns and stickers wounds us, protect us with your blue jeans of faith. When our heads would get hot and our tempers rise, cool us with your wide brimmed hat of salvation. Reminding us that nothing separates us from you. When we would throw rocks in anger, show us the rod of your spirit, the word of God, who reminds us to love our enemies and heal their wounds. Walk with us as we begin our journey and help us to be in step with you and in you, wherever you lead us. Amen. We have called out to God, and God has heard our cries. God's merciful spirit has poured out on all people. Our Creator has offered us forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ. For we have humbled ourselves before Him and sought His mercy, and so we shall be called, I'm sorry, and so we shall be exalted for these abundant gifts of God's undeserved grace. Let us stand sing praise. Amen. Please join me now in hymn number 336, Oh, Worship the King. Let's worship him this morning. 336. <laughs>
church family, uh, our biological families, um, those who you love. And uh, if there's any concerns, God hears you right now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning. God, you are the one and only God. You are the creator of all things. You, Father, are infinite in space and in wisdom, in love, in grace. God, we as humans don't get it, but we believe it. And we believe, God, that you can do anything and that as Christians, our goal is to follow your will. We just praise you, God. You're so massive, yet so tiny. You are in our midst here this morning. We welcome your Holy Spirit. Just allow our God to permeate this building. Allow us, Father, to feel it. Father, we thank you for another beautiful day. Your grace is just shown everywhere. And again, I think I say this every week, the, the drive over from Hagerstown, Shelly and I were talking about the beautiful colors of the leaves and the mountains and the way the sun shines over it. God, that's all you. <laughs> that's all you. And we just praise you, God, for just showing us each day evidence that you are God. Father, we think about our, our church family. Think about Sue. Father, we heard some good news this morning about her, and uh, God, we just pray that you continue to heal her. God, you made her. You can heal her. We give her to you. We allow you, God, to be in control because we aren't. Father, we want to remember our friends Carol, Mary, and Dot, who can't be here anymore. We just ask, Father, that you would allow them both to feel your Holy Spirit the way we do here in this building right now. Father, let them think, well, where is this coming from? It's coming from you, God. Father, we give this church to you. And God, when I speak about the church, I mean the people here that you have put here at Trinity. Nobody is here by accident, God. You have brought everyone here this morning, and you bring them every Sunday. I pray, God, that your will would be done here, that our hearts and minds would be open and listen to you, God, and serve you and worship you here as a church in this building. Father, we pray for the community. We pray for our state. We pray for our nation. God, we're close to electing a new president. Father, uh, it's my prayer that everyone in this room will pray before they go into the ballots, that they listen to you, Father, and they pray according to your will, not according to their wants or desires. We pray for God, we pray for the world. Matthew, the book of Matthew describes in the end times there will be rumors of war, there will be war. It's, it's happening, it's been happening, God, but it seems to be getting worse. And even in that, God, it, you have told us that it's going to happen, you're keeping your promise. And so we look forward to the return of your son. We are one day closer to that. That is for sure. We don't know when he's coming, but he will come at the right time. And he will take his people home. And Father, now we end this prayer using the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And thy kingdom come Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now come to the time of worship where we worship God through our offerings, our gifts, and our tithes. This is a, a means of worship. We're giving back to God a portion of what he has given us. So now I invite the ushers to come forward, please. <coughs> This morning's scripture comes from Ephesians, surprise, chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. Hear now the word of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, 
against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Here is the reading of God's holy, precious word. Thanks be to God. Steve, I just have to uh, thank you. I appreciate you uh, for doing our music. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And Linda, all that you do, thank you. This morning, as I uh, look through the scripture again and look through my sermon, um, I can truly say that God said, Richard, you got it wrong. Uh, many pastor friends of mine have said that before, that uh, in their final study and prayer, that God has spoken to them told them that they need to either go a different direction or make some changes in their sermon. And so I'm going to do that this morning. Um, I was going to do a brief review of Ephesians, all five chapters in the first part of the sixth chapter. And honey, it would have only spent been a couple of minutes, I promise it would have. Um, I think that some of you are so, so, so glad that this is the last sermon uh, of Ephesians. It seems like it's been forever, but uh, just to be totally honest, um, if I had been here every Sunday, we would have been done before the end of May, June, July, August, September, October. So it seems like it's been forever, and it has been, but it's been spread out. And my concern is that, that you're not retaining. And the reason I wanted to preach from Ephesians is because it, it, it's Paul speaking to a church that is functioning. They're doing okay. But they need to grow. They need to do better. And that's why I chose Ephesians for you because you're struggling. You're small. You need to grow. You need to do better. And the only way you're going to do that is to dig into, into the Word and listen God. So I'm not going to do the review. I'm going to get straight to um, straight to our um, verses for the day. So uh, this brings us to today's message, chapter six, or six verses ten through seventeen. In this, Paul talks about spiritual warfare. Spiritual. Warfare. Let me begin by saying that the word of God is true from the first word to the last. This book is true. This book, although it was penned by men, was inspired by God. Every word of this book is from God. This might not be an easy sermon for you to hear. It is going to be difficult for me to deliver because I'm going to get personal. The reason I want to do this is to show you that I am human too. And maybe you are going through some of the same things that I am now. And maybe through God's word we can get through it together. So first, let me talk about what spiritual war is all about. Who is this war against? What things? Well, it's against the things that Satan throws in our faces, trying to pull us away from the gospel, the true gospel, the true word of God. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He wants us to. God loves us. 
He wants us to succeed. So after telling you who we're fighting against and what we're fighting against, I'm going to tell you how to fight it. And again, it's not me telling you, it's the Word of God telling you. Um, <clears throat> can't argue with, with the Bible. Can't argue with the Bible. When I read the verses here, the, the first word that, that, that I see is the word scheme. The Greek word carried the idea of cleverness, crafty methods, cunning, and deception. Satan's schemes are propagated through the evil world system over which he rules and are carried out by his demonic hosts. The word schemes is all inclusive, encompassing every sin, moral practice, false theology, false religion, and worldly enticement. In the Bible, the devil is described as the anointed cherub, the ruler of demons, the god of this world, and that's lowercase g, god, and the prince of the power of the air. This war is not against flesh and blood. It's not a war between humans. It's not a war between cultures or races. It's not a war between nations. It's a war against spiritual forces and wickedness, all orchestrated by Satan himself. I'm going to share a story with you. It's already difficult before you even start. A few Fridays ago, um, I I call it hitting a brick wall. Um, any runner that runs long distance or uh, marathons call it hitting a wall where they just they can't they stop there's a lot on my plate I'm being honest with you there's a lot on Shelly's plate um, and Satan is attacking us from different directions that Friday I was trying to prepare the second half of the yard that I didn't get done before all the rain, <laughs> although that side of the yard looks really good. Um, and I was getting it level and it was all, the dirt was nice and soft and whatnot. And my little redhead wife comes out and says, Paul, Paul, can I put my footprint in it? <sighs> yes, why did you put your footprint in it? He put two. And then he proceeded to go around all the way around the edges of the yard with footprints. Yeah. Looking back, that's precious. That's funny. That's typical childhood behavior. But I was exhausted. I was fighting that yard. I was able to pull up part of what what was it? Cistern, yeah, I, I, I've got the corner piece that someone didn't, I was able to, this big, I was able to get it out of the ground, and big rocks and whatnot, I finally found why part of the yard was never green, not very long. So I worked my, I'm sorry, my butt off. I was done. And those footprints, you've heard the phrase, the straw that breaks the camel's back. That was just a precious little straw. But I was at a bad place already. 
I was tired. I was exhausted. So I stopped. I went inside. I had um, prepared a, a pork roast. It was sitting on top of the stove. Um, evidently, the kids didn't want a pork roast because Shelly was making grilled cheese sandwiches. And uh, my flesh said, wow, I did that, and now she's making grilled cheese sandwiches. So I did what I call turning the switch off. I went upstairs. This is 6 o'clock. I went upstairs and I went to bed. Where there's nothing. I just needed to be alone. I needed to escape all of the things that Satan was throwing at me. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not Wyatt. It's not Shelly. It's not the grilled cheese sandwiches. It's all the demonic forces that has been working against us as we try to raise these grandchildren. He doesn't want us to be successful. I was going to lay in bed indefinitely. <laughs> I just, I was in a dark place and I was just going to stay there. I, I'm done. Switch off. When I finally went to sleep, I had nightmare after nightmare after nightmare. I slept through the night. I don't know when Shelly came to bed. I do know when she got up. Uh, but I stayed in bed because I'm going to stay in bed until whatever. And they're going to find out what it's like for Paul Paul not to be doing things. That's, that's selfish, isn't it? <clears throat> but that's the dark place that I was in. And I'm going to confess, I didn't even want to talk to God. God got me up at noon. He said, Richard, that's enough. Get up. I got up. I went downstairs and Shelly says, what's on your agenda today? And I said, I'm going to be selfish today. And I walked out the door. When I'm like that, I have to be working. And I have to be working hard. If I was a boxer, I'd be hitting a punching bag. If I'm still a runner, I would run 10 miles, but I'm neither one. So I have to work. And I'm trying to find things that I need, and I'm throwing stuff out of the way. My garage, my shop is a mess already. And after that, it was a different mess. But that's how I deal with anger. I went back into the house for something, and Shelly says, what's wrong? <laughs> I unloaded on her. I allowed my anger to speak to her in a way that I never before. She didn't deserve that. She didn't deserve that. But she is so gracious and loving. She didn't say anything back. I just let it all out. And it, it all boils down to the fact that I do so much and she does too. She only has a full-time job. Okay? So I'm with the children while she's working. So I'm not saying that I do everything, but I'm saying that I do a lot and I was tired. I felt unappreciated. I felt 
You just been abused. Notice that I'm using the word felt. I sinned against my wife. I sinned against God. And I had to ask him to forgive me. And I promised Shelly, I don't know if it was later that day or the next day, that I would never, ever, ever yell at her like that again. That was the first and last time. And now I'm saying it publicly. I should have given this sermon before this happened. Because God gives us tools to fight against the attack that I was receiving. I want to read something to you that comes directly from the church's website. I'm not going to name the church. I don't need to name the church. But I am going to read what they have in writing. It says, we had a minister some years ago that said that there are two different types of churches. The first type is one that preaches that the Bible is the Word of God. Meaning that if it's written in the Bible, even though it was written by people, it is the actual Word of God. Amen, anybody? It goes on to say the second type of church is one that preaches that the Bible contains the Word of God, meaning that as the Bible was written over thousands of years, the wisdom and lessons can be inferred by cultures past and cultures present. It says, our church is the second type of church. Each of our members believes what they believe. We are not monolithic. We are not the same politically, socially. We, when we hear a message from the pulpit, we are not told how to think or how to interpret the Bible verses. That is left, left to us as thinking humans. The goal, we believe, isn't to make us the same. Rather, it is to understand that in our differences, we have the same needs, the same thirst for answer. Now, I would say, in our differences, we have the same needs, the same thirst for answer. I say amen to that. Okay, Gigi, I'm going to pick on you, but I know you're not the only one, honey, who talked about this. I had to look up monolithic. Now, I know mono means one, okay? Monolithic. The word monolithic, as it is in theology, and I've already said it, I, I am assuming there's at least one or more people in this room right now that don't know what that means. But what it means is mon, mono, monotheism is the belief in the existence of one true God, one true God, or in the oneness of God. Isn't that what we believe here? That there's one true God. Our Apostles' Creed says, I believe in God the Father, the Father Almighty who created heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only, only begotten Son. One God. Three parts. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Now, I've been told that this analogy stinks, but I'm going to use it anyway. I have a head that has a brain. I have a hand that can shake, and Kevin gives real handshakes. 
and I have feet that I can walk, that I can get up and go downstairs and pour my coffee and get started in the day. Three parts, one body, it functions as one body. If any of those parts are gone, it does not function the way it should. God is three parts, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, one being, one. I would say that that church is what we call a fake church. What I read is truly false religion. It's a false theology. We cannot in our minds and understanding and comprehension interpret the word of God. God interprets the word of God. Sometimes we have to go backwards in scripture to get to the verse to understand it or forward past it to understand. We have to understand who wrote it, who their, his audience was, why he was writing it, what circumstances were going on. So you cannot take just a little verse and make it mean what you want it to mean because, well, that's what I believe. So here's a couple words that support what I believe. You cannot do that. And this church is saying you can. John, first chapter, first verse says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God's word. Now, in, in in this, when I was young, I thought, okay, in the beginning was the word. Well, how did that happen? And the word was with God, the word was God. God already had the Bible. No. The word in that scripture is Jesus. So we can say in the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God, one God. God's word was just and true from the beginning, even before anything was made by him, anything in the world. And it's true today, and will be true tomorrow, and true for eternity. It does not change when cultures change. What this church is saying in their in their own um, their belief system is, I'd say, very clever, crafty, cunning, deceptive. That's how the word of God describes Satan, Lucifer himself. So this is what Paul was warning us about, and Paul is warning us now, it's good now too. He's warning us, or in, in, he's, he's telling us how, how, how do we fight this war with Satan? How do we recognize and fight false doctrine? Well, you've got to be in the Word, folks. You've got to read your Bibles. And if you don't have one, please buy one. I recommend a study Bible. I have said this many times behind this pulpit. You need to be in the Word. Don't trust me. Read it yourself. And if I'm wrong, come to me. And if I agree that I'm wrong, I'm going to apologize to you and to God. And I might stand up here and tell you, I was wrong. Don't believe the man behind the pulpit. Believe the word of God. Check him out. Check me out. I dare you. <laughs> I dare you. Ephesians 6, 13 through 17 tells us, Therefore take up the full armor of God, that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything to stand firm. I think Linda has a little graphic up there. Oh, no. Like it? If, if you 
what would you Please, you know, just so they can kind of see. They might not be able to read it, but it might help them to understand. There's six things that Paul tells the Ephesians. They says, having girded your loins with truth. Truth. Girding up was a, a, a matter of pulling up the loose ends as preparation for battle. The, the belt that pulls all of the spiritual loose ends in is truth. Or better yet, truthfulness according to God. The idea is of sincere commitment to fight and win without hypocrisy, with self-discipline, in devotion to victory. That's number one. The second one, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate was usually a, 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 a tough, sleeveless piece of leather or heavy material that contained uh, animal horns or hoofs pieces sewn in. And that was to cover the soldier's full torso, protecting his heart and other vital organs. Because righteousness or holiness is such a distinctive characteristic of God himself, it's not hard to understand why that is the Christian's chief protection against Satan and his schemes. Next, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Roman soldiers wore boots with nails in them to grip the ground in combat. The gospel of peace pertains to the good news that through Jesus, believers are at peace with God, and he is on their side. This is that confidence of divine support which allows the believer, you and me, excuse me, you and me, to stand firm knowing that sincere he is at peace with God. I am at peace with God. You are at peace with God and his strength. Next, we take up the shield of faith. This usually refers to a large shield that protected the entire body. The faith to which Paul refers is not the body of Christian doctrine, but basic trust in God. The believer's continual trust in God's word and promise is, in addition to all, necessary to protect him from temptations to every sort of sin. All sin comes when the victim falls to Satan's lies and promises of pleasure, rejecting the better choice of obedience and blessing. Temptations are likened to the flaming arrow shot by the enemy and quenched by the oil-treated leather shield. When Satan shoots his fiery arrows at us, we can put on Next, taking on the helmet of salvation. The helmet protected the head, always a major target in battle, of course. You know, you're done. Paul speaking to those who are already saved, therefore not speaking here about attaining salvation. Rather, Satan seeks to destroy a believer's assurance of salvation with his weapons of doubt and discouragement. This is from Paul's reference to the helmet as the hope 
salvation. We have hope in God. Not, I hope that God exists. I have hope that tells me that God exists. I have hope in His protection. I have hope in Him providing for our family. Not, I hope that one of you guys buys me a 1967 GTO. Kevin, how many times have you heard that? <laughs> this is hope. This is assurance that God is God and He will take care of you. I lost my place. Once a Christian, once saved, always saved. You cannot lose your salvation. Satan wants you to believe that you can. Satan wants you to think, oh, I, I'm standing behind the pulpit at Trinity, and I'm doing this? Uh, I don't deserve that. But God, by his love and grace, says, Richard, yeah, you screwed it up. But I forgive you. I need you to do what I have sent you to do. You see the difference? Romans chapter 8, verses 35, 37, 38, 39. This is God's word and promise. Who was here? Here is God's word. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a promise that if you are truly saved, you cannot become unsaved. Once you become a child of God, once you are in his family, no one can take you out. No thing can take you out. Satan wants you to think that he can grab you and pull you out. Who was here the week that I had um, um, Ethan stand on the chair? And I'm on the ground, and I said, Ethan, you're a Christian. I'm a non-believer. Pull me up. He couldn't do it. You can't either. I yanked him down. That's what Satan wants us to believe. He can yank us down, and you're no longer a Christian. Lie! Once saved, always saved. Don't forget that. I know I'm being loud, I know I'm being bold, but I just, I have to. Finally, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is your sword. As the sword was the soldier's only weapon, so God's Word is the only weapon we need, which is infinitely more powerful than any Traditionally, the sword was only six to eighteen inches long. It was used both defensively to fend off Satan's attacks and offensively to help destroy the enemy's strategies. It is the truth of Scripture, the Word of God. I asked Linda to put this little guy in here so that you can look at him when you need to and remind you, remind me that God gives us all of this to fight off Satan. 
Now, we cannot fight Satan. We're people. We're humans. Satan is an angel, a fallen angel. He is extremely powerful. I like to put it this way. When you challenged God, God said, nope, fine. That easy. Along with a third of the existing angels, he just, Satan is extremely powerful, but compared to God, he is nothing. And he has nothing over us. It's us as humans that allow him to put things in our minds and in our hearts, deception, lies, greed, uh, immoral things. And then it's up to us to either give in or give up. I don't mean give up, give up as in don't do anything. Give up to God. I saw on YouTube one time a man that said, um, God, you have a problem. And um, people say, why are you saying, God, you have a problem? God doesn't have a problem. Yes, this man was dumb. He couldn't do it anymore. He gave it to God. Give God your problems. Don't try to fight. Use the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, and the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In conclusion, here's today's application, and I'm sorry I know what but I'm not sorry that I went over. <laughs> the application is very simple. When Satan attacks us, we do not have the power to fight him. But God does. He will give us exactly what we need at the exact time we need it. Even before we ask for it, God knows that we need it. It is there. He's like, come on, take it. God is never surprised. Never. Because he's all-knowing. He knows exactly what we need even before we do ourselves. And he provides. All we have to do is take it. It's so easy. So hard. Here's today's big idea. If you can't remember this, then uh, I don't know. It, it's very simple. When Satan attacks, put on the full armor of God. We can remember that, right? When Satan attacks, put on the full armor of God. Let God take care of you. Let God take care of you. That should have been the hymn that we sang this morning. An old Baptist hymn. Let God take care of you. Instead, what are we singing, Steve? Armor Christian soldiers. Number 617. Would you please stand with me and sing? <laughs>
Christ, help us, Father, help us, help us each and every day. Remind us that we are Christian soldiers fighting a war against the enemy, but we cannot do it ourselves. We need you. We need you desperately. Our world needs you desperately. No election is going to change anything. You, Jesus, you're all we need. You will provide. You will hurt us with your armor when we need it. It's my prayer that we ask for it. So, Father, as we do our separate ways, just be with all of us. Bless us. Encourage us, Father. Even though this was a tough message this morning, there's joy in the end that you will provide, that you are the God. And you can protect us from the evil one. We give ourselves to you, God. And keep us ever mindful of your presence as we go about our daily life. In Jesus' name. Church, go in peace.